So next up is Jeremy Kerr with a talk on the power architecture. So Thank you very much. Um, my name is Jeremy Kerr. I work for the IBM uh, Linux Technology Center. And um, before we get started, I have a bit of a confession. I've uh, actually been uh, spending the last year working on less kernel and, and more firmware. Um, I'm allowed to say the F word, right? Cool. <laughs> Uh, so firmware doesn't typically have a great reputation uh, amongst, amongst system implementers and, and kernel developers. Um, not typically open, modifiable, verifiable. Uh, generally, you get a, a, you know, a binary bit of, uh, bit of firmware that does things like introduce interesting bugs into your environment. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about today, uh, what, sorry, what I'm going to talk about today is how we're trying to address this a bit in, in open power and a bit of a general set of information about what, uh, what open power is. Um, and I guess we'll start there with a broad overview of, um, of, of open power. For, it's, it's three things, basically. Firstly, a, a system architecture based on the, the IBM power designs. Um, it's a, a collaboration of development of, of hardware, system, and firmware between the Open Power Foundation's member, uh, member parties. Uh, and thirdly, it's a, it's a Linux-based platform uh, for generally targeted in the, the sort of the cloud, the server market, um, HPC as well, uh, and we'll sort of go into how, that, how the lineage uh, it defines that in a little bit. Um, so three essential things. As I mentioned, there is an Open Power Foundation at uh, openpowerfoundation.org. Uh, and that uh, the website there is, is sort of where they track uh, the members and the, basically all the, the designs and things are, end up on the in the Open Power Foundation, hopefully available on, on the website. I did mention earlier that uh, the, uh, the Open Power is an architecture, architecture as well, the core of which is, is Power8. Um, there's been a few talks on Power8 or over both this LCA and, and previous. Um, if you haven't seen Paul McCarris's one earlier this week, uh, let's just go and download it. Um, but the first open power machines are based on, on power rate uh, processes. Uh, they're quite interesting uh, from a CPU architecture point of view. We have uh, 96 threads per, up to 96 threads per socket, uh, some interesting transactional memory uh, capabilities, and a, a new function called CAPI where uh, devices can participate in the coherency protocol between memory and, and CPU. So some interesting things there. Um, but we're sort of concentrating on, on the Linux side now. Um, and what does power rate mean for the, the, uh, the software stack? Um, to find out, we'll sort of step, in step back in time a little bit here, back to the, um, the pre-Power 4 days when the Earth's, uh, Earth's magma was cooling. Uh, we had a... Um, the architecture itself defines uh, what we call a, the machine state register. All, all power machines have this, uh, this machine state register, or MSR. It's described by the power architecture definition. And it, it defines uh, what state the machine is, funnily enough. Uh, things like whether the floating point unit is available, whether external exceptions will, will enter the processor. Uh, and one of the bits in there is uh, it's called the PR bit uh, for problem state. So if that, uh, if that bit is one, you're in supervisor mode or operating system. Sorry, if bit is one, you're in problem state mode, which is general user space. If the bit is zero, you're in supervisor mode, which is, um, which is the operating system. So this bit controls whether you can do certain things like execute privilege instructions or access certain bits of memory. You know, can you access memory with translation turned off and hence access all of memory? Or if it's, if it's one, you're, sort of, you're in the usual constraints of running a user space process where you have only a certain set of translations and you can't execute arbitrary instructions. You have a, a smaller set to, to execute. So this is the pre-Power 4 days. Sometime around Power 4, um, the hardware folks introduce a new bit into the, the MSR uh, called HV or, or uh, hypervisor. And like the, the PR bit, it controlled whether you have access to certain resources, certain instructions or certain translation mappings. Um, so again, in, in the table here, we have if you're running with HV equals 1, you're in hypervisor mode. Or if you're running in HV equals 0, but PR equals 0, you're in supervisor mode. And if you're running in PR1, then you're in, in user space. However, the hardware folks didn't really tell anyone outside of IBM at the time. So we didn't really have this HV equals 1 bit available. It was, 
not listed in the power architecture. Well, it was listed in the power architecture just as a reserve bit. There was no, no mention of, of hypervisors or anything like that. Um, so it wasn't really available for, for general use. Now, this, this wasn't a huge problem. This is way before we had any open source hypervisor code to run uh, before any sort of uh, 4 KVM was out. Um, and before hypervisors were a, a huge thing in, in our world. So essentially this made um, a Linux running on power would always run in, in what would be a guest environment. Um, and and if, if Linux or if your operating system isn't using it, what's, what's it for? We have this thing called, called PowerVM. Well, it's called PowerVM now. It may have been called something back in those days. Maybe, perhaps. The power hypervisor, right. Um, and, and what's it doing? So it started out, we have a, originally a very light hypervisor, um, not necessarily visible. Again, because we didn't see this thing described in the architecture, wasn't really visible. Um, and essentially, we're running on a system with, with PR equals 1, PR equals 0 mode, um, except we just had a one bit in the register, which was marked reserved, always set to 0, because we're always running in, in non-HV mode. So this meant things like we, all of our benchmarks we'd run on, on powerful hardware were always running with this very light hypervisor going, and, and no one kind of objected to it. There wasn't a huge amount of uh, effect on the system, uh, and, and we got quite good performance, even with this tiny, tiny hypervisor running, running our, our normal OS in, in what would be a guest mode. Over time, over the generations of, of um, power systems, the, the hypervisor grew more functionality, made it into more of a complete sort of virtualization solution. So you could buy one of these, these power machines um, and it's pretty much like a, a ready-to-go uh, guest, um, guest running operating system. You could put you know, multiple OSs on it running at the same time. Um, but of course, this hypervisor is, is IBM internal. So um, it meant that uh, you, know, you, you weren't writing code for the hypervisor, you're writing code for the guests all the time. Uh, the management systems for this are proprietary. I mean, you, you get these, these great bits of software where you could you know, drag and drop uh, guest OSs around and, and that sort of thing, but it's all proprietary. And, and there's nowhere to run any, any Linux code or, or any whatever you like code in this HV equals one mode. Now again, it wasn't, wasn't a huge problem. There wasn't a lot of, um, wasn't a lot of code that, that you would want to run in HV equals one mode. But over the time um, that this was happening, over the generations of processes, um, more and more open source virtualization solutions like KVM were, uh, were coming out and, and we'd like to run those. You know? We have a system that's capable of, of this hypervisor mode. We have a hypervisor. We'd like to put the two together and, and, and make a, a nice system. So the big change for Power8 is that we now don't have this hypervisor layer between Linux and the operating system. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing separating the OS from the hardware. There's no higher privilege code than the OS. Uh, there's nothing that is going to steal your cycles or anything like that. Uh, and there's no bits of hardware that, that you can't access directly from the OS, which is a big thing for us. We, uh, we like having access to the entire machine. We want to make sure that we know what's running on the machine and we want complete control of, of uh, what our systems are running. So using this, um, we now also have access to all the, the functionality that we get with this hypervisor mode. So we can use uh, KVM and use the facilities of the architecture to implement a Linux-based hypervisor. It, it, I mean, we're, we're not exactly like this. We do need a, a little bit of firmware. Um, but in this case, the firmware is, is less of a separation of OS from hardware and more of just a, a bit of a hardware abstraction layer. I'll go into that in a, in a little bit. So I guess similar to what you think of as, as an x86 machine where you don't have a, a giant bit of software that's between the OS and the hardware, except now on x86 we're seeing this kind of thing happen where we do have a, a higher privilege layer of code, uh, the SM BIOS, which is doing things like uh, handling certain interrupts that never go to the OS. It will receive an SMI, system management interrupt, go into SM system management mode, execute some magic code that you have no idea what it is, and then possibly return to the OS or, or elsewhere. So we've gone to this, this model here where we no longer have a hypervisor. We have Linux running in HV equals one mode and a bit of firmware to sort of help that out. But the important thing now is it's all open source. So the entire stack that you can run on a... Uh, <laughs> 
the entire stack you can run one of, one of these machines is verifiable. It's uh, editable. You can see what what uh, what software your machine is running from the first instruction onwards, which is really important for us, especially you know with the um, I'm sure Matthew has, has told us last last LCA about the importance of, of knowing what you're running, uh, and and also being able to modify that and making the system do what you what you want it to do. So again, you buy an open power system, you run code on it. The first instruction from there from boot is yours. As well as being open source, it means that it's available for, for others to implement. Um, so we have this, this source repository on, on GitHub, but part of the, the open power license, sorry, open power architecture being licensable is that others can implement open power hardware, which is also a, sort of a, a big thing for us at IBM. So the first example here is the uh, Google's uh, recent uh, announcement. Oh, I think it's getting a bit on a bit now, but uh, their announcement of their um, their custom open power board based on uh, two power eight CPUs. Uh, so they designed the board. They have also um, uh, modified uh, the the open power firmware to 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 make to accommodate the hardware that they've designed, uh, and have built an open power system in what we think is pretty pretty quick time. And because they're able to modify the hardware and the firmware, they've customized the the hardware itself to their their workload, which um, I assume they're pretty happy about. One of the other designs based on, on this is the, um, the Tyan Open Power Reference System. This is something that you can buy online at the moment, I believe. I haven't tried, but it's, it's there. It's, it's probably less expensive than traditional IBM Power hardware. Uh, and it's, uh, it is listed as experimental, so there will be bugs. There will be things that aren't implemented yet because the, the, the firmware is still, still being developed. One of the interesting things about this platform as well is that we, it's based on a standard ATX motherboard. So in theory, you could pull it out of that server and put it into your, your desk side system and, and have something really noisy next to you. Um, maybe maybe Tyan will produce a, a, like a, a, or sell the motherboard separately, I'm not sure. But interesting that we're sort of moving towards a bit more of a, a commodity, commodity parts in the, the power design, which was sort of unheard of uh, in the power seven days. So, also interesting for us that this is the, the first time that we've have, we'd have non-IBM companies releasing power hardware, um, which, which is great. So a bit about the, the implementation, um, about what, we'd, what we've been doing over the last, uh, last, couple, or last year or so and, and what all our exposure to the firmware is. Um, firstly, the bits we needed to build. So, the, when, when you turn on your open power machine, the first thing that starts executing, uh, well, there's some little bits, but the, the main thing you start executing is, is host boot. And this is a um, responsible for early hardware specific doing things like bringing up the, the caches, the memory, the clocks, uh, uh, the, the, the time tracking systems and whatnot. So this is a, a fairly self-contained thing now. It executes entirely and then passes control again entirely onto uh, this, this new project called SkiBoot. Um, it's executed by Hostboot. By the time Hostboot is running, sorry, by the time SkiBoot is running, Hostboot has stopped entirely, so the, the system has been handed over to, to SkiBoot at that point. And SkiBoot does further machine initialization. Some of the things that Hostboot didn't do, uh, it, um, it provides, uh, I think, some more, some, basically the, the, more of the I.O. side of things, so some interaction for PCI devices. Uh, and, and then also produces the, the runtime interface um, for, for these machines. So we, again, we have a workload, we have an OS, we have this firmware down to the side, and that firmware itself is, is skewed at runtime. And, and less, less of a firmware than, than just a hardware abstraction layer um, in, in that it doesn't uh, run in ex, any extra privilege level than the kernel. It doesn't, uh, doesn't receive any interrupts. All interrupts are routed directly to the Linux and then, the, and then if, if the firmware is to handle that interrupt, Linux will then pass control back into the, or into the firmware to, to do what it needs to do. Uh, so its only entry point is, is, a, is a call from Linux. Uh, and the, the entry point is defined by a, a new, new firmware OS interface. Uh, it's, not a, it's not an x86 PC BIOS. Uh, it's not a UFI interface. It's basically just a, a set of function calls with a a defined API. So it's really, it's no different than having a, a little library 
the operating system can call to do certain hardware, hardware dependent features. Um, the uh, the as, as as a sort of fairly regular PowerPC firmware, it is device tree based. Uh, so a device tree allows us to describe the hardware that's running um, to Linux, and Linux will parse that device tree to find out what's what the uh, the hardware looks like, and and probe the hardware based on on the information in that device tree. So Skiboot is very small. It's it's the our our plan is is for it to be as, as compact. Um, as possible, and to steal as few cycles as possible. Not steal, you actually give it cycles because you call it from Linux. Um, but in, in that vein, we haven't implemented an operating system loader. So uh, there is, Skiboot doesn't have any, any functionality to execute your grub or execute your, your U-boot or whatever else, um, because that would require reading grub from disk, or it would require you know, doing, doing some network uh, uh, implementing network stack to get a loader onto the system. So instead of implementing all this stuff in the firmware, what we've done is used um, PDBoot as our operating system loader. And that means that we have a, basically uh, the first thing that Skiboot executes uh, when it's finished in its initialization is a little embedded kernel that's burnt into, the, it's, it's flashed onto the hardware itself. And this kernel um, contains little init ramfs, which has some user space utilities um, that perform the functions of a boot of of what you'd expect your BIOS to do to pass control to an operating system. Uh, so that means we use a standard Linux kernel for our bootloader. We have the standard Linux network stack. We don't have to write our own stack in firmware. We have all the standard Linux device drivers. We don't have to re-implement device drivers in firmware um, to do our boot. We just have a little Linux kernel plus a little bit of uh, user space glue that uh, that loads the final operating system kernel and then kegs x into that uh, into the your actual your Ubuntu or your, or your Fedora or your RHEL. So essentially, our, our our BIOS interface is a user space application. Um, the, the the user the UI that you use to you know, so like set your boot order or set your network boot or everything is just implemented as like as an NCurses application running on Linux embedded in your Flash. So in that regard, our, our firmware doesn't have a lot of functionality that's provided by, by these bits. And, and one of the justifications for doing this was, was bring up time. There's no way we could write an entire firmware with a network stack with, with device drivers from everything you'd want to boot from. Um, we can just use what's there in Linux and, and go straight from there. So another, another one of the components we've, we've worked on is um, the platform port, uh, the Power NV platform port, uh, NV for non-virtualized. And this is the, the bit of Linux that interacts with our, um, our new firmware op uh, API provided by Skiboot. The API itself is called Opal, Open Power Abstraction Layer. And it's the, um, uh, the base for, for Power KVM uh, hypervisor. So, KVM running on Linux will, will use these Opal calls to, to interact with the hardware. Um, the, the platform port is, is quite small. It's, it wasn't a huge amount of code. Um, it's, it's not a huge amount of difference from the previous or the other the Power, PowerPC platform code. Another one of the, the bits of software that, that makes a, um, an open power firmware is, is uh, what's called the on-chip controller code. Also open source, we have a little um, CPU on your CPU uh, that is responsible for thermal control, uh, power management, sorry, electrical power management, uh, and, and provides the back end, so the hardware specific back end for our CPU freak driver. So basically um, sets and registers, the OCC reads that and, and updates the frequency of your system accordingly. Um, one of the other parts of, a, of any sort of uh, server class machine is some sort of management controller. Um, we use a um, a BMC from uh, another company, and this provides um, out-of-band management that you'd expect. Be able to turn your machine on and off over the network, get a console over the network, um, and, uh, and and all the sort of things you'd expect from a um, a server platform. Uh, it is it's, it's fairly standard sort of in the x86 world to, to be able to send IPMI commands uh, to your server and get it to start, stop, um, and it has a separate network interface. Well, sorry, it has a separate MAC address to 
the rest of the system so you can basically define a, uh, a management inter- network alongside your, your device, your server's network. Um, I think Matthew's got a talk coming up about IPMI and, and that'll be kind of tied into this. But uh, yeah, this, we have a BMC, which is kind of what you expect on a, on a server machine. Um, and to tie it all together, we have um, some build infrastructure called OP Build. Uh, this is, a, is responsible for basically getting all the bits of source we need to, to produce a, an open power firmware, compi- basically compile them using a compiler that it builds itself. Uh, and package it into a, a single flash image that you can you can then burn to your machine. Uh, it's based on the existing Builderit project, uh, again an open source sort of uh, uh, package building system, and and that uh, constructs our constructs a few things. It constructs the um, the PD boot user space environment, which which is our bootloader. Constructs a kernel to um, to execute that. The, the, and all, all the firmware components that, that also need to go into Flash. So it's all built in, in one, um, one step. Well, download and build. So this is how you would um, build, build open power firmware. Um, it's all fairly unconventional. Um, we clone it from this repo, uh, change the directory, and then do a, basically, a, it has a menu config style interface. We just load up the, um, the Palmetto def config for a Palmetto machine. And then, and then build. OP build is basically just a, a, an alias for make. And, and there we go. Some notes on, on kind of the open source side of things here. Uh, we, have, we have ways to customize the build. Um, we could uh, say build with a different version of, of Ski Boot. I think um, 2.1 is completely imaginary at this point, but um, this is how you would do it if you want to specify a particular version of, of a particular package. Sorry? We started at a four, so don't do this. <laughs> Um, so the idea here is that you, when you're building open power firmware, you have complete control about which packages go into that. You also have complete control about where those packages are sourced from. So you can point the OP build system at, um, at an existing tree and, and you'd have in, be incorporating that particular sources rather than, than what we've, we've defined already. Um, there are, there are also many other different ways to control the build. Um, it is a standard sort of builder environment. We've tacked some bit onto it, bits onto it, but there's nothing particularly special about it. So you can define lots of variables to say, use this version or use that tree or, or even use a custom set of patches that, that you provided or just completely ignore the, the, the version control and build, build something that you've hacked up yourself. So uh, there's a lot in there. There's a lot of documentation or there's a bit of documentation in the, in the GitHub pages about, about how you can go about doing that. Um, so yeah, so basically what we have now is, is a, um, a firmware that you have complete control of, uh, a system that if you like to hack on hardware, you could build your own. Uh, and that gives us a bit of a, a, a new way to, to build uh, machines for, for you know, custom data centers, custom cloud deployments, uh, without having to, um, to redefine the computing industry. So I, I, think, I think we're pretty happy about, about what's happened so far. There's still a long way to go on, on polish and and using, you know, enabling new CPU features, getting new hardware out there. But um, hopefully we've learned to like firmware just a, just a little bit more. Um, I've left plenty of time for questions. Uh, usually there's, there's a few feature requests and things. So please uh, ask away. Just a question on the petty boot. Yes. That, that used to have a graphical user interface. Have you still kept that for some scenarios, or is it all just curses now? It, it's still in the tree. I haven't built it for a long time now. Um, so a bit of background here. So petty boot was, was originally built for the PS3. Um, and the PS3, so the PlayStation 3 power PC machine with a little bit of flash, similar constraints. We want to be able to burn our kernel into flash and then boot your proper operating system from that. And we had a, like a nice sort of PS3 type uh, UI that you could operate with the controller. Uh, and it was based on Keith Packard's LibTwin. Um, I, we've only recently got 
more than a text console on, on these power machines. So firstly, there hasn't been a lot of motivation to, to implement it, but um, it, it could it could well be re reinstated. Um, it's probably not the best sort of thing in a server environment where you want to have a low bandwidth link to your, to your management, but um, it could definitely be done if, if necessary. If you implement a 3D one, that'd be even cooler. <laughs> Uh, just curious, um, you of course mentioned the fact that you guys are quite happy to have um, a full stack when you can run Linux bare metal. Were customers asking for that a lot, or was it just mostly the developers like, we want this because it make your job is easier? I, I might have to let Anton come in and correct me if, if I'm making anything up here. But um, that was a big feature in, in why people wanted to use something that's... Um, that's open power based. They, they can control the hardware, they can control the entire software stack and not only customise it to what they want to do but know exactly what they're running. Um, and doing things like um, finding out, I mean latency is a huge thing in, in large workloads. You, you want to make your system, your cloud, whatever, is only going to operate at the constrained by the worst latency system you have. So the idea here is that if there is something in the firmware that's taking up latency, in our case you can see what it's doing, rather than having like, um, sorry, yeah, if it's a black box, you, you, you're less able to measure it, you're less able to verify why your, your latency is, why you're getting jitter on, on the OS, uh, and also just, just knowing what the hell's happening on your machines is, is a big thing. Um, Anton, is that, you going to cover this? Yeah, I was just going to explain that uh, what Jeremy's been talking about is uh, the open power machines that will be produced by vendors other than IBM and perhaps by IBM in the future, that the current Power 8 machine that you can go and buy is not exactly like Jeremy described. It still has the Opal firmware, uh, but it has a, a service processor instead of the BMC, and the service processor will only, light, will only flash a signed image that's been signed by IBM. So you don't have that, that amount of freedom to modify things on the IBM Power 8 systems. However, the, the Opal... Uh, ski boot stuff is, is still open source and, and you can get the source of it and so you can see what's there. And it's still true that uh, you're running it, like this picture um, with the OS running directly on the bare hardware and this, this Opal firmware layer providing a library of services rather than being a layer that gets between you and the hardware. Yeah, yeah I just need to clarify or expand on something Paul said there is that open power machines aren't don't encompass the entire set of Power8 machines. There is Power8 Open Power and Power8 IBM Power. Um, and the Open Power ones are basically, it, it's, um, they're, they're implementable, for, implementable for anyone, but only IBM can sell an IBM, IBM Power machine. So what I've been describing here is, is the Open Power side of things. The, the IBM Power would, is still based on the, the open source um, components we've been talking about, but sort of comes in uh, in a in a different, diff, slightly different uh, sort of management architecture that uses some more IBM components than, than these open power machines would. Yeah, thank you. Um, so traditionally, power hardware has been tightly coupled with AIX. I'm curious, with this new um, firmware architecture, is yep. AIX also running on it, or is it going to have a, a proprietary stack for those machines? So you're asking, does AIX run on yes. open power machines? I haven't seen it running. I don't know of any plans to make it run. Um, the Open Power Foundation is focused on Linux. So um, as Jeremy Kerr, the conference attendee, not Jeremy Kerr, the IBM employee, I, um, I'd be very surprised if that would happen. So that's probably a good point to say. Yeah, if you could, thank you. Just, just making it clear. So AIX uh, only runs as a guest, it requires a hypervisor, and only PowerVM is supported, so AIX is only supported on PowerVM at the moment. Um, and, and PowerVM does not run on the open power machines. Okay. On, the, on the IBM Power 8 machines, you currently get a selection in the, the, the Linux only ones, you get a selection in the service processor web menu as to whether you want to run Opal and all of the stuff we've been describing, or alternatively, PowerVM. So you can power on the machine with PowerVM and then you're just in the PowerVM world, you know, like we, we have been for years. So that's the, the sort of it's a dichotomy. 
And if, you, if you're an AX customer, then you're over on the Power VM side. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the focus of IBM Power, sorry, of Open Power has very much been kind of the, the massive scale of Linux machines rather than uh, your, I guess, I guess, cathedral versus bazaar sort of thing. You, you want your cathedral of IBM AX, traditional IBM Power machines versus your, your bazaar of, of all kind of things we can implement on Open Power using different hardware designs, different software designs, and things that you can control yourself. So that's, yeah, that's, that's about the gist of it, as I understand it. If, if I wanted to build an Open Power machine, do I have to have a whole bunch of IBM components, or is it fairly limited? Um, I, I'm not in the, the hardware business myself, but um, I would say that you would, you would at least need you know, an IBM CPU, and then you could probably build the rest yourself. So. <laughs> the question was whether Mikey has access to a foundry, and, and if so, can we come and visit? Um, but are, are we, and are we, are we selling licenses to implement a new Power 8 compliant CPU in not an IBM foundry? Is that? We are. Okay, so, so the entire core is licensable. We can, we can, you can produce your own Mikey Power 8 and, uh, and go from there. Yeah. <laughs> I'm waiting for it to bed and breath. <laughs> um, I've got a few resources in the slides. Uh, the slides will be up with the, um, with the conference agenda after the conference, I believe. Um, so our GitHub repo, our mailing list, and our little home in the, in the kernel tree under Platforms Power NV. OK, if there are no further questions. Um, I can. Thank, Thank you very much. And yeah, give you your obligatory. Thank you for. <laughs> <laughs>